So, just to give you a quick background, I started about three and a half years ago at the Royal, and when I joined, um, we were being run by shared service, and I know that a lot of organisations are part of shared services, there's probably people from shared services here. Um, one of the disconnects we had is that we actually hosted that service on behalf of the whole of Merseyside, but we had none of the senior management team within the hospital. When I was appointed, I was the only um, information or IT person who actually worked for the hospital. So it was a large um, university hospital, um, it was the largest in Cheshire and Merseyside, it still is the largest in Cheshire and Merseyside, yet the only one who had no IT. So it was, it was quite a strange position to be in when I actually joined. They had no strategy, no direction, and this isn't a criticism of the um, health informatics um, who were leading it at the time. I think, to be honest, they'd, they'd found themselves <coughs> taking on a bit of a turkey when they, um, when they were joined because it was thrown together in such a hurry that they didn't really know where to prioritise and assumed that the large acute trust would be fine and uh, would just concentrate on everybody else. What happened was five years later when I joined, the Large Acute Trust had not had any investment for the previous five years, was on its legs, and nobody really had any confidence in what we were doing with IT. So I set about pulling together a strategy, which was looking at more than just IT, but it was looking at the information, it was looking at what we needed to do as an organisation, where we wanted to go, how we needed to build the staff to take us there, the skills, and how we needed to focus on patients and staff as the drivers. So what you see is this three areas there, the objectives which um, enable new models of care, patient centric, staff have got to be at the forefront, be productive, look at innovation to drive us forward and make sure that all the information that's been delivered is trusted and it's delivered at the right time and the right place. Um, I won't go into the detail of all the rest but I mean the core ones there is we really need to improve the IT that we're using and we need to not just upgrade it to the latest and the fanciest but actually give the right information that enables the information that's held within it to be used for the clinicians for the benefit of patients. Now that was the key driver behind it and when we set out it wasn't me saying right here's a strategy that I've done before, this is my Blue Peter one, and pull it off the shelf. I actually got down with the patients, with the staff, and said, right, what do we need to do? What are the priorities that you're facing now and over the future? You know, what is it that we need to change, and where can I focus my attentions? And that's where we came up with things like the intelligent clinical systems. By that, we mean a clinical portal for patients, uh, sorry, for clinicians and for patients and GPs. Something that pulls together all the relevant information. Um, this is where we said, right, it's got to be patient-centred, so it's got to focus around the patient. Everything has got to focus around the patient, because at the end of the day, we're here to treat the patient. We're not here for self-serving and gratification. You know, it isn't about the organisations, and at the end of the day, the organisations, if the right thing to do is sacrifice themselves, they should do that for the better you know, of, of healthcare. And it's got to be patient-centric. So we built that in as an ethos right from the very start. You know, that has got to be our focus. Everything else was just about, we've got to sort out the crap as well. You know, we've got no investments in here. We've got no hardware. We've got no infrastructure that can support all these things. So we've got to do something. And we've got to do something quick. And we've got to bring the staff on board as well. So what we did was set out we need a vision, we need a strategic direction. It's all very well pulling together uh, a strategy plan and just for the record I've left copies of them on the desk if anyone wants them. Uh, it is the summary version but it's the nice glossy one so I thought I'd bring some along. Um, but as you can see where we were at the time that we set off it was a case of let's be realistic we're not going to get there in one go. You know, we need to look at what's real, you know, how we're going to do it what we need to do in terms of bringing people along. We need to understand what the impact of all these changes are as well, because if we just throw a load of new technology at the staff, they'll you know, just put their hands up and run away scared. So we've got to make sure we're doing it in a way that brings the staff on board as we go along, that they buy into it. And as I say, it's got to be patient-centric. Now, don't get me wrong, we're in challenging times, so it's also got to be uh, financially viable. It's got to save us money. And actually, we've proven time and time again in the NHS that if we improve our services and invest in quality, we actually save money in doing so. And anyone who tries to cut 
to save money always finds himself a couple of years down the line at the back end and we've talked about midstaffs and we all know what happened there and actually uh, Neil knows better because Neil was in um, Shrewsbury and Telford at the time and I was actually at Shropshire and Staffordshire at the Health Authority at the time um, actually used to manage midstaffs in a previous life before it all went wrong I'll just point out um, where I would put my hands up and say I was probably one of those who were pushing around the finances and you know I was a performance manager for midstaffs about you're going into trouble here your finances are going off the kilter they weren't an FT at that time but I was putting the pressure on them in fact I was instrumental in them merging with Canuck and you know to get some savings there Thankfully I did move on, although uh, I did come back afterwards to help out on their coding issue. But that aside, one of the key things there uh, that went on is that they just did a cut. They didn't look at what the impacts were on the services and the quality, and they hadn't put robust governance in place. So they weren't looking at the impact. And as I said on the last one, you've got to take people along, you've got to understand the impact of changes. If you cut services, you need to know what the impact and ripple effect is. So one of the things that we've done within the Royal is we've set up a good governance structure so that when we do make a change, if it's an investment, if it's a change of system, if it's a change of service, or even a proposal, we actually run it through this process, which is we've got our PMO in the middle, but we've actually got our operations, which is our management side saying we must have, we need this, you know, this must be there tomorrow. But then we've got our clinical side saying, okay, what would this mean to you? What's the impact? What is it you need? And actually the systems that are being proposed, are they what you will use? Because you've got to own it. You're the ones who are going to use it, not me. If I put something in and you don't use it, I've just wasted hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's got to come from you. And it's about bringing everyone together to understand when you do something, it's got to be together. You'll notice finance committee was at the top of that slide. And we probably all have this headache, which is at the end of the day, we've still got to sell it past finance, um, which can be a, quite a challenge, especially at the moment. And you know, no one is immune to that. I have those problems at the moment. But the good thing there is once you can prove that it's improving um, the quality of service that we're providing to a patient, as well as showing that it, it makes a saving, and you can always show that it will make a saving because if it is improving quality, you will save somewhere. Uh, and that's what finance wants. They just want to know, you know, if it's proven quality and it's cost neutral, fine, they'll let it through then. If it saves them money, brilliant. They'll push it through and they'll be kicking up the arse afterwards to make sure it happens. Um, one of the other things we did was we said, right, if we're going to change things, we've got to look at our information as well. We've got to look at how we use information. It's not about systems. It's not about processes. It's about what we do with it. And we've got to get confidence in for the information. We didn't have confidence in our information department when I took over. Um, we didn't have a data warehouse. We didn't have one source of data. We had thousands. Um, Neil just talked about each consultant having their own database when they went back to the office. You're not joking. If one database in ours, it was three or four. Excel, Access, we even had Word ones where they tried to be clever or in-house built in C++, C Sharp and Access. You know, the amount of stuff we got was unbelievable. We even got one in DB2, which none of my <coughs> technical team even now know how to manage. Um, but one of our medical engineers decided he liked the language and built a whole pre-op system in it. Um, you know, we still have these headaches. But what we did, we said, right, we've got to look at what we're going to do in terms of bringing everything together. We've got to make sure that we've got something that people can believe in, one true data source. So all our systems must focus around being able to provide that one source of data. Because otherwise, you end up in arguments between departments about, well, my system says this. Why is yours saying that? And Oh, maybe it's a difference in time and it's the flow of the data. You get rid of all of that and you bring it into one area and you can, you can basically cut out so many arguments overnight. But from that, you can then start to standardise on your applications. You can standardise on the technology, the feeds, the information that's held within it. You can start to look at uh, reusing your document repositories. Um, you can get better performance out of your infrastructure. So you get multiple benefits by doing it. Now, I started off with a headline that said uh, VNA versus the EPR, and uh, as a or Neil's the DPR Odyssey. So you never told me that. I could have changed it quickly. Um, well, I was trying to figure out a way of not saying journey because in another talk there was journey and I looked on the thesaurus 
I don't want to see a journey with the same words. I've got yeah. my thoughts. Yeah. Is that complicated? No, I do see that. That's, that's why you should tell me. Um, one of the things I've got on here is about the traditional view of the EPR. Now, I hate standing behind podiums. I put this on because everyone's had this as a driver through Connecting for Health, and I know in hymns you've got the seven layers rather than the six, but this is where we started with the six layers about clinical administrative data, your PAS system, and you'll notice PACS is down there at number six because I think that was something we'd all worked towards. Actually, that was something we all delivered very early on in the journey. You know, very few of us have actually, uh, sorry, um, yeah, it is number six on there. It's uh, checking on the new hymns, it changes. But very few of us have managed to get through level three, four, and five, but we all managed to get level six very quickly because of the national programme. So we can all say, yes, we've, we've delivered against this. Very few of us have, and I know we haven't in our organisation. I did a talk for our board uh, a little while back, and they asked me about this, and I said, well, we've got this, we've got that, we've got clinical orders, results, we've had that for a while, we're putting in um, decision pathways at the moment. Yes, we've got electronic access to knowledge bases, we've got an email link to the BMA, you know, that's close enough. Um, specialist clinical modules, well, around the trust we've got thousands of those. Um, Document imaging, yeah, we've got that in our A&E department. After someone comes through, we scan the referral and then it disappears into a black hole, but we can, we can tick the box. So, yeah, people can fudge these things and we can tick boxes and we can say we're delivering, but the reality is when you look at it, it's what are you delivering? You know, what is it you're trying to do and why are you doing it? And how is that actually improving what you're doing for the patient? So we sort of did ours in a slightly different way. And I apologise because I'm not very artistic and um, you know, this is my really crappy diagram of uh, essentially what we've done. And here we said, well, we need to digitise our case notes. It's a major problem. It probably is for all of us. Um, you know, we've got five warehouses, count them five warehouses, and I don't mean little rooms, I mean actual warehouses off-site where we store a couple of million health records of different states. We've got 12 libraries around the hospital, we've got three sites, 12 libraries within the hospital itself. Now that's an awful lot of records flowing around, so we needed to sort that out. Because trust me, that was a major headache for me. Something I've had a lot of grief over the last two years trying to resolve in terms of missing notes. Uh, we had an audit from the ICO because of notes going missing from patients taking them off. Now, it's not a great position to be in, trust me, having the ICO crawling over you. I actually interested in on the back of that now go around presenting with the ICO on some of the things we've done that but that's another talk so you have to come along to that one as well. Um, digital dictation, one of the drivers that uh, clinicians said would help out is let's get digital dictation in there you know, and you think well that's, that's a no-brainer, you know, we've been doing that elsewhere for years Why? and I've been at other trusts where we put that in. Why haven't we got this here? We're a big university hospital. I can't believe we've not had this, this driver for digital dictation before. Or the comms, we got it in, but we, we weren't really using it. In fact, when I started, uh, it's SunQuest Ice is the one that we use, um, we were one of the first in the country to put it in. We worked with Anglia, as they were before SunQuest, and we actually helped to develop it within our trust. And that was something I didn't even know. But yet our usage was around about 15% in the organisation of clinicians using it. And it's now 99% uh, in three years. But I, it was why? You know, we're putting systems in here that you know, we're not even questioning why we're using it and getting the engagement from staff to take it on. What's the point of us doing this? We've got to turn this round. And you know, we didn't actually have an interface engine at the time, which was unbelievable. We were, you know, we were querying direct on our PaaS. You know, so whenever something happened to the PAS, which it happened quite a lot to the national system, you know, weekly we were losing the feed, everything went down. You know, there was no store, there was nothing to manage it, and when it went down, nobody could ever tell me why. You know, and that was the biggest frustration, which is people lost faith because they come to me and say, it's not working again. And I'd say, oh right, and that would be the first I'd know about it, because I had no alerting system, and I'd then go off and try and find out why, to be told, it's all right, it's back up. But what happened? <laughs> so you, you pass that message out and people lose confidence in you. Um, clinical letters, we, we put in a system called copyright and inscribe, depending on whether you wanted to do audit on it or not. Um, and I was finding that some clinicians liked it and some hated it. And I couldn't really work out why. And eventually I got to, I got to grips with it, which is 
you know, when you were seeing multiple patients, what happened was the way that it had been built uh, is that depending on who you were and whether you were put into one database or active directory field or group of another, you could see part of the patient's records up until a point, but then you then had to go and request and be put into the other one as well because depending on who you were, what time of day or anything, you couldn't see the whole of the record. You could only see part of it. So we've rewritten that now and, and that's coming in as part of some of the work we're doing. Um, electronic forms, paper. I hate paper, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I, I say that, so I manage the uh, health records. So you think I'd like uh, paper, but I can't stand this. Um, and my office is you know, floor to ceiling with paper, but every time I go to a meeting, I get handed a pile of notes, the trust board papers are like that. And I, I get them, whether, it doesn't matter the fact that I say, don't print them out, don't give them to me, I'll look them on the laptop, yeah, I'll look them out to anything. Without fail, they just get automatically printed by the printers, get sent out to everyone in there. And try as I may, I haven't managed to persuade the board to go paperless yet. There's two of us who use an iPad and our laptop and we do everything on there and we've got the paper stacked up and we take all our notes. Everybody else are there with the paper writing on the notes and then you've got to ask what ever happens to them. Because whenever there's a query about any of the past uh, meetings or what's been discussed, within seconds, oh no, we said this and I'll bring it up. That nobody else on the board can actually tell me that, even the corporate secretary who's there taking the minutes and writing it down by paper can't tell it to me. And the other thing we've been looking at as well is, I, I put the Royal Cloud, I'll just say, but we had actually set up uh, an NHS cloud. We're quite proud of that. And so if you, if you want some storage, come see me afterwards. I can sell you some. Sorry, John and uh, James, and still your thunder, but uh, it is your technology it's sitting on, sir. Um, the other thing is, on the back of this, um, I led the Cheshire and Merseyside Consortium to replace packs, and we'll all have been there at a the moment, going through the packs replacement. Um, and I actually started that over 18 months ago where I was looking at what was coming on down the line and I was thinking, we need to be doing something about this fairly quickly because this contract's up in the next couple of years and nobody's talking about this around the patch. And I'm, you know, I'm not hearing this from the radiologists, I'm not hearing this from any of the other trusts. And I know how long it takes to put in a system because I've put in packs elsewhere, I've put in EPRs elsewhere, I've put in digital dictation and, uh, and document management elsewhere and a PAS and trust me they weren't quick projects they were two years you know, and some of them still going on after I've left so it's a case of somebody really needs to be doing something here so I set up a consortium to look at, um, at what we need to do and how we go about replacing our packs and at the time we were doing it the biggest issue that people kept saying to me is getting our data out you know? and what we're going to do about that and do we just move it all into a new PAS supplier, uh, PAC supplier and go with it or do we take control of it and I said well realistically from just listening to people we've got you know, a 50-50 option we could do either way but let's take control because there's other things that we want to do and I know this isn't the right venue for it in the, in the PAC's board but actually if we were to hold that data ourselves and control it that gives us a lot more control later on for what we need to do so we looked at the VNA. Now, I started off by saying we needed to have a vision. And this is one of the things that we were looking at as part of our strategy. I hold to that because in any project, and I think it's really important, but you don't just start talking about what you're going to deliver, but you talk about a vision of what it is you hope to be able to achieve at the end of it. Not a physical output that you'll have, but actually what's the change that you're trying to deliver. You know, it's about improving the service. It's about better services for patients. It's about ease of service for clinicians. So it's selling that vision because then you can start to put in the nuts and bolts around the vision and start to build it in. So as part of what I do and as part of the strategy, you know, you'll, you'll find elements refer, referred to in the document. It talks about setting the vision as the key thing to move forward. You know, lay out on the table why you're doing something. Then start to go through the processes because you can start to pull people in. And so I pulled that up because I just thought it's quite interesting because people tend to miss that and they go straight for the you know for the solution. We need a VNA. We need the packs. Well, we need to look at uh, you know the end of the contract. But actually, you start with what is it we want to do? Well, 
and this was my vision by the way so I brought it up here so you start with um, what is it we're looking to do it's not about replacing the packs because actually we might have decided to keep it it's not about putting a V&A because we might come up with an option that says V&A is not for us so it's got to be what is it we want to do and then look at what gives us the needs you know what what supplies us with delivering that and our vision here and we put this on because actually our V&A we we, um, we do offer that out to other NHS trusts because to be honest it is an investment and you, you've got to have a commitment to it it's like anything you know when you start putting these things in it's about how can you share this and make best use of it and part of that is saying well actually we're not a silo organization we want to work in partnership with all our neighboring trusts so when I set this up and I say I meaning my team you know I don't take full sole responsibility even though um, Neil might have said, it, I, I, I'm the leader and I'm one of the most innovative and I must find out who that second person is and talk to them. But um, to be honest, I just come up with ideas and you know, I've got a great team who implement them and come up with some of the fees below. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to create something that other organisations could then buy into, you know, to save them going for the pain because we all share it. And actually we share the benefits as well. So set up... Um, a platform with a vendor neutral archive, and you probably guessed by now, but I did decide to go down the VNA route, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have been here. Um, but one that's at an enterprise level that I could afford, you know, I could offer out to the neighbouring trusts. So ones who really couldn't afford to do it, or uncertainty about the future and what was going on, different stages in their uh, development cycle. And one of the arguments we had at the time was why a VNA? So I thought I'd bring this up because people do ask me, what is a VNA? Every time I talk about a VNA at a trust board, you know, I get blank stares. It doesn't matter how many times I say it and tell them, you know, I can see the glazed overlooks. I'm looking around here, and thankfully there aren't any glazed overlooks. Otherwise, you're probably in the wrong meeting and you've wandered near by accident. But I thought it's useful because it is a medical imaging technology when we talk about this, but it's not just a medical imaging technology. You can start to bring other things in. Ours is based on our document management system, and I, when I was doing this and looking at the V&A, I went to um, to John and the guys and said, "You know, our document management is a document repository. It holds all data feeds and different data types of, uh, of stores." I said, "Why can't that become a V&A?" And the answer was, "Well, oh, it could." Yeah. And so I said, "Right, what is it that makes a V&A different?" And we started at that point, which is actually let's just reuse what we've got rather than going out. And one of the reasons why I did that is because I did actually go out and get some ballpark figures and nearly fainted when I saw the cost coming back. But um, I thought, no, let's do this in a way which is, you know, reusing what we've got. It's it's building on investments we've already made. But also that bottom bit there, such that they can be accessed in a vendor neutral manner by other systems. I was keeping an eye open on what else was going on around the organisation. I may have been concentrating on the PAX replacement, but I've got a hundred other projects that I need to concentrate on as well. And one of those was cardiology and the issues we're having with um, the Accelera system and Philips. And another one was in our ophthalmology system and some of their legacy um, systems. Uh, um, Orion, God, nightmare. And I mean, there must be something I can try and do to bring all these together without having to go out and be procure every single time. So I thought, now oh, get something in place that can help me do all of this. So, you know, reasons why. I've already talked about um, control, but that other one at the top, and I've put that top because supplier locking is a big problem. And I say that now with conviction because of the fact that I've just gone through the pain of getting the data out of CSC and GE. And that's not a criticism of each of them, it's the contract that they were in. But the reality is it, it's taken months of wrangling, of transfer, of problems with the data flows to get that data out. Third parties to do it. There's, there was no, here you are, here's a disk, take your data, it's yours, you own it. It was, you can have access to your data. That's part of the contract, but you're responsible for paying us to come and get it, and you work to our needs and our requirements to do so. And I would have done exactly the same if, was, if I was in their boat, because that's the contract that you're in. You know, when we set this up as a national contract, we didn't think about how we were going to get out of it. We just thought how we're going to get into it and the benefits we get. We never thought about our exit plan, so we've had a big problem there. So prevent, uh, prevent supplier locking was key to me. Now you might say, well. 
aren't you locked into your VNA supplier? No, you're not, because the standards you're putting in mean you can move from one to another, and that's the whole beauty of it. Minimise your storage estate. Well, rather than having to get more servers with my pack supplier for a VNA, I'm reusing what I'm doing with my document management. Now, don't get me wrong, I did have to buy servers because you've got to hold this on things, but actually the storage, it means I can capitalise that and I can scale out. Improve interoperability, oh, I can't even say it, now and in the future. It's about making sure your systems talk to each other, getting that common standards. And I know you'll have heard this time and time again over the last few years about standards-based approach so that systems talk to each other. And yeah, it's true. In the NHS, we all have systems that are work run in total isolation. And I had a, um, we ran a clinical summit last Friday. We do it every quarter where it's about 200 of our clinicians, get them off site for the whole day um, we have key members of the board where we'll present on things like this in terms of what we're doing, new technologies. Very quick, we don't do an hour, we do probably five, ten minutes so I've had to pull together quite a few slides here for you and I will rattle through them in a second. Um, where we get their feedback on what they want to do and what their issues are based on what I've just told them and try and get their feedback. And I was surprised on Friday on the tables I was going around chatting to them that some of the systems, because they still say, oh, can you come and help me? I've got an issue, I've got a database and what we do. And even on Friday, after two years in, I was getting consultants saying, oh, you've sorted that problem, thanks. I don't need to come along to the board anymore. I mean, no. Yeah, this is the programme board where it's all clinicians, going back to that government structure. It's all clinicians, a couple of managers, a couple of nurses, a couple of admin staff. And uh, they think that because their problem has been resolved, they no longer need to come. You know, so silo focused, which is, it's my issue and I'll work up until that point. And as soon as you've sorted my issue, that's someone else's journey from that point on. Until it goes wrong again, then I'll come back and engage with you. And it's trying to change that mentality. You know, it really is difficult. So improving interoperability, which is... Get rid of this silo mentality, make sure all your systems talk to each other because actually that means you start to share data and the clinicians have to start sharing data and they have to start talking to each other. It's a great thing when that happens. And I also spotted an opportunity and um, this may come back to the innovation side which is, you know, I've been in a small trust where I couldn't afford to do this. You know, you've got to really jump through some hoops to get investment. And, you know, in my organisation it was... Um, it was one of those points in time where we really needed to make a radical change to what we were doing. You know, if we're going to do it, we're not going to do it small. We're not going to do it piecemeal. We, we had to rip out and replace so many different systems which were end of life 10, 15 years ago. But how on earth did they carry on? You know, your cardiac team have probably been in there every day pumping them up. But the reality is they should have been decommissioned. So we said, look, let's do this right. You know, change lots of things at the same time based on the strategy and what we want to do because we've got that golden opportunity. And let's do it in a way which we can start to offer out to other trusts. And I don't mean let's make loads of money. I mean, you know, let's do this for the greater good, which is where we can help out other organisations. This is a non-for-profit. We do so because to help other organisations get there as quick as we can means we all gain because we can share data, we can share knowledge, we can share skills, we can invest together so we get better deals. And, and so that's what I wanted to do. You know, let's go along it together. Now, I thought, let's talk about challenges. This is a challenge I did. It was one of my friends 40th a few years back. And he said, I've always wanted to jump out of a plane, but I'm too scared to do it on my own. I said, I'll do it. I'll go with you. So that's me at the back, you know, with a big thumbs up. I didn't show you the picture of me jumping out of the plane because to be perfectly honest, it's something even now I have nightmares about and reliving that moment I didn't want to do, but it was a challenge that I had to overcome. And I use it because everyone thinks the challenge is too big, it's too great for them, you know, it's too hard to get this sold you know, for, um, for what we need to do, it's too costly, you know, we'll never get it through the board, it's too big a challenge. But actually, you know, once you've got over that fear and you understand that you can make savings down the line, you can do it. And 
The other thing is, it's future proof, so you make greater savings as you move along. And that's what you've got to keep telling yourself. You're going to have costs moving down that line that you haven't come across yet, that you haven't factored into your business case. And sometimes it's almost a leap of faith, but you will save money if you go down that route. Now, we had to put some specific requirements. What is a V&A? And Mark will talk more about it, but I'll throw that in just for the mix, because it isn't just about a technology <laughs> where you say you store data. You've got to be quite keen about it. You know, what are you trying to do? Shared XDS registry. We want to work across the site. You know, we want to work across the community. So you've got to look at the technologies that allow you to do that. Tiered storage architecture. Retrieval times are key. You know, people will not take on a new technology if it's slower and doesn't work as well as what they had before. Backups, we're going digital, we're putting in backups out of my ears. You know, we've got instant recovery capability and you know, it, it has to be that way. But you've got to have a formal process, you've got to make sure that people know it. When you go digital, you can't afford for downtime. It's not like, that's right, we'll go back to paper. Oh, wait a minute, we stopped paper last year. Anybody got any stores? No. It's got to be robust. And it's got to be able to work across multiple organisations. So you've got to think bigger than just your own organisation when you're going down this route. Because what you need to be able to think of is, OK, we're in changing times. You know, reality is, your organisation may not be there in five years in the way that you know it. And I say that because I don't believe mine will be either. You know, I think things will change drastically over these coming years <coughs> and we just need to be prepared for it. You know, throw the politics out the window because actually this is about making sure that you're ready when those changes occur to make sure that anything you've done now is future proof and it can work across organisations whether you do it from the start or not. The ability to do it at a later point is key. Now this was something and so you probably can't read that. We looked at what storage data we've got in ours for our VNA, and across our patch it worked out to about 154 terabytes just of what we needed to put in. It's actually a lot more than that, but it was just what we wanted to put in from the start. And we said, right, based on activity we're doing, you know, what's our growth going to be? And it's quite staggering when you think about it, you know, going up to 475 terabytes. And you might say, well, actually, that's, that's not a lot. That's purely on studies. You know, actual uh, growth is probably twice, three times, four times that. Because the more you start to use this and use the technology, and we've already found this, we've had a 60, 70% increase in our storage requirements in the last year because people <coughs> buy into it and they want it and they demand it. So you've got to think about that as well. Anything you're doing, you know, you've got to be able to scale it out. Likewise, you've got to make sure that you do not get a worse performance in whatever you put in than what you had before because people will comment on it, they will criticise it and they'll keep referring back to the good old days of the system they used to have. They'll forget about how crap it was, they'll just remember that it was faster than what they've got now. Now, when you're looking at what are your drivers for change, it's not hard to look at what's going on you know, nationally. We've got a decline in funds. We've got a big push, as we've just talked about, to go digital. We've got to get interoperability of systems. We've got to get things talking to each other. But there's actually other drivers as well. Growth in data is massive, you know, and it's just going to continue growing. So you've got to look at new ways of how you're going to cope with that. And also, research. Research is a golden opportunity for NHS organisations. It's one of the few areas where we're actually bringing money in to the organisation from outside because we have such a rich cohort of data that private sector is desperate to get their hands on. But also, but internally, our academics and our clinicians are desperate to get their hands on because we've held them in silos and we've not been able to use that data across different systems in a way that means we can use it for research purposes for us as well as for the private pharmaceutical companies. So that is another thing that you need to think of, not just your area of what you do, think of the bigger picture which is you could be putting in something here which actually opens up a massive market for you, you know, around access to research and data. And of course, you know, supporting collaboration. We're not in this on our own. You know, we're the NHS and we keep forgetting that. We work together. We shouldn't be working as silos against each other. We should be working together. We talked very briefly then about breaking down silos because a patient doesn't know the difference between primary care and secondary care. 
you know, what's tertiary, what's secondary, what's primary. All they know is they go to their GP and they want to be treated. And if that means they go to hospital, they go to hospital. And I know that I'm a patient. Most of my staff are patients, and I'm probably most in here. I'd be amazed if we've got someone so healthy they've never been to a GP in their life. Please tell me what you're eating and what you do, because I'd love to know. Who here has never been to the GP? Apart from the Americans who go for a physician. Okay, do you go there thinking, right, I'm going to go there, and I know that my primary care trust has commissioned this, and they're going to send me here, and I'm going to challenge them because I want to go there. No, you go thinking, doctor, tell me what's wrong with me, and I trust you to tell me how I'm going to get better. And if that means I'm going to secondary care for a hospital, because I don't know secondary care, I know that I trust you, but that person who's taking my scan or who's take, doing the decisions about me, they know what they're doing, and they're doing it because it's the best thing, and I'm going to trust them. We've got to work together and we've got to break down these barriers and we've got to start building systems that will enable this because we're very good at building systems that stop it now you can't have failed to notice it's red nose day today so i couldn't do anything without putting the red nose on but i've fallen short of putting the wig on that my daughter wanted me to wear and the glasses and the red nose because i felt that might be going a little bit far um what are the benefits that we've got then you know coming back to the royal which is you know, my primary focus I've got a system now that's future-proof, and I can go to the board and say, yeah, scalability, I'll, I'll have to buy more storage at some point, or I'll go into the cloud, and I will. Um, but I can do that very easily. I don't have to go out to get a whole new rack of servers uh, and migrate data from that because it's full into a whole new one, because I know how long it takes. I can just plug something else in, and I'm up and running, I've got additional capacity. Uh, I'm not tied into it. I'm there, I use the supplier and the software that I'm using because I want to and I've got control of it. Nobody else, I have. And by that I mean me, the royal. You know, we control that data. You know, I don't have to jump through hoops to get at it. I can do it. I can do it at it. I'm reusing my document management software. You know, these things are not cheap to buy. You know, and nobody will ever tell you they are. And if they do, think why is it cheap? Because it's probably a catch that they've not told you about and you'll get caught out at some point. So, you know, prepare, you know, to pull together a business case which is probably talking in the hundreds of thousands or millions, you know, over the lifetime, you know, when you start going down the route of document management and V&A and PACS. Because PACS isn't cheap, document management isn't cheap, and it's not so much the software, it's the processes, it's the people change, it's the management, it's the support, it's the time it takes to do these. You can't do them overnight. So I wanted to reuse investments. The reason for that is it meant I could speed up a lot of that process. I'm doing an awful lot of work on document management and the infrastructure, and I've got that sold. So I want to reuse that, I want to sweat those assets. So I wanted to make sure that I was doing something that allowed me to use existing investments. Now, quite often we don't do that in the NHS. We look at what we're doing in our department, be it health records, radiology, cardiology, and we go out to tender for a system that gives us what we need in our department. You know, we don't go and say, would this work for you as well? We say, this does what we need. Um, so my EDMS software, and I use Documentum by the way, which is why I'm invited here, because it's uh, an EMC technology, is, um, allows me to now use it as a V&A as well because of the guys at Synapse and the you know, what they've done around it. And don't get me wrong, it's not easy to do this. You do need technical skills and you need people who specialise in this area because it's patient data at the end of the day. You can't afford for something to go wrong. But it was about making sure we could do this. I didn't have to go out to procurement. That was another benefit. You know, three months of tendering and believe me, we did a tender as part of the Cheshire and Merseyside Consortium for a B&A and I wasn't part of it. And at the end of it, after all of that, they still couldn't decide on something because actually when we came down to it, the technology that we had selected through the OGU turned out to be something they weren't quite telling the truth on. And um, it had elements which were going to come online in the next year or so. Uh, now when someone starts telling me that, I get, I get nervous because I need evidence that it does what it says. You know, it's the Ron seal, it's got to do what it says on the tin. Not, it will do that once it's dried in a year's time and uh, if it rains along the way, it might not dry in that time. So you've got to be careful about that. But the other thing now, I can collaborate. I can collaborate with all the trusts around Cheshire and Merseyside. And 
that is something that we set out to do as part of the national programme. You know, and we're how many years down, 10 years into it, we still haven't been able to do that. We can in Cheshire and Merseyside. Now, we're still putting it in. Don't get me wrong, the PAX is going in. We've got a couple of trusts in, um, we've got another few on the way going in now, and it'll all be done by the end of June. You know, that was the deadline, and it's all on target, and it is on target. You know, and, um, and those trusts who have uh, actually got it in are saying it's going very well. Don't get me wrong, there are niggles along the way, there always are, it's a major change management programme, it's a brand new system, we're moving to a new way of working and we're not just replacing the system, we're actually redesigning how we do health services uh, and share data across Cheshire and Merseyside as well because the opportunities that this has given uh, are golden, so why waste them? You know, don't look at it as your department, look at it as the bigger gain, and that's what we've done. So we're looking about reporting across the whole of, the, uh, you know, whole of Cheshire and Merseyside using the skills in each of the organisations, where there's shortfalls, how can we help each other out? You know, setting up hub and spoke models where we can start to consolidate people together to work better and more efficiently. You know, all of these become possible. The other thing is as well, and I didn't put this on here, uh, is our link to the clinical portal. We created a portal for our, pay, uh, for our clinicians where rather than putting a massive uh, electronic patient record system um, and you know, a complete replacement for our PAS. We said, actually, we've spent years building up, getting forms in, getting our clinicians trained, getting them to buy into these underlying systems. Let's put a, a, a vanilla layer on top, which they can customise, they can design. In fact, they did. Uh, they even went down to the colour schemes, they chose their own colour scheme. Uh, uh, you know, didn't care about that. As long as it brought clinicians in, I was happy. And all it does is it sucks data and presents it to them for a patient across 20, 30 different clinical systems. It doesn't pull it into a new data repository and grow the data and duplicate it, it just presents it and it's the underlying data. If they want to go into it, they just click on it and it'll take them down into the underlying system. One true source of data. Any reporting on it goes through to you know, the warehouse, so again, one source of data. You're not doing multiple feeds, but it retains it in full patient context. Bringing all those into the VNA underneath as well means again, one true source of data, patient context, scalable. And this is the big area as well. You know, scalability on medical records, it's the biggest storage area I'm going to face moving forward because I'm not just going to scan records, I'm not just going to put PAX data in there. As I move forward, you know, I'm pulling all the electronic data that I'm catching digitally from all my patients. I have somewhere in the region of 10,000 medical records moving between departments per week. That's a hell of a lot of paper-based records that I'm going to get rid of and make electronic. You know, you've seen the study growth for the packs. Once we start to get these things up and running, that'll double, triple. I need to be able to scale that out and I need a system that can allow me to do it that in five years time when the contract's up on the care stream, one we've just put in, and I go back out to tender, but if I go with someone else, I plug them in, it's standards based, I don't have to do any migration of my data, I don't have to spend six months pulling it from one system to another, I just put the new one in, train my staff, and it's pointed at the repository and I'm up at money. And I know that all the uh, organisations across Cheshire and Merseyside, they can get the data and the GPs, because I've not had to do anything on that, I've just put a new front end on it. So that's a very big benefit. Remote connectivity, that's just about remote working. Yeah, that gives clinicians ability to do it from home, which they do like. Um, and that's one of our opening up opportunities, which means in terms of having an on-call um, rotor, you don't have to physically be on site. You can do it from anywhere, and the clinicians do enjoy the fact that they can be at home without having to travel in, and especially when they're on call and they have to be within 20 minutes of the, of the trust, which means they usually end up staying across the road in our, uh, our own hotel accommodation, which I have done twice now, and uh, regretted probably twice as long you know, after uh, my back recovered from the remaining days. So you know, that is a benefit for them. Okay, so that's what we've done within the Royal. Um, and it was a whistle-stop tour, and I know it was covering a few areas, and there's so many different things I could talk about, but it really is quite difficult to do so, or to do it justice without boring you all to tears, and hopefully I haven't done that this morning. Uh, but thank you very much for your time.